Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to see what the world looks like through atheist eyes. I'm Frank Zindler from American Atheist Press. Now, usually the atheist eyes through which you would be invited to view the world would be my eyes alone. Today, however, you'll be seeing the world through two extra atheist eyes, the eyes of August Brunsman, the founder and executive director of the Secular Student Alliance. Let's see what he has to tell us about his philosophical coming of age. It is an immense pleasure today to introduce you to a man that I have known, I think, now for probably more than half of his life. I think. Right about. Yep. <laughs> uh, I want you to meet uh, August Brunsman, who is the executive director of the Secular Student Alliance. We're going to have a whole program on all the details about that, but right for now, I'm telling you he is the executive director of the Secular Student Alliance, and how impressive that will be, you'll find out later. First of all, August, thank you for being on my show. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, it is indeed a delight. I, um, I think that um, our viewers... Uh, my viewers, I should say, who have been tuning into my channel, uh, are often, are usually interested to know how someone uh, became an atheist or, you know, where they hatched as an atheist or how, however this is. And I think um, in your case, it's really pretty interesting um, since, uh, as I recall, you were reared by Buddhist Tibetan monks. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but they were under they were under deep cover, Frank. They okay. were pretending to be atheists to blend oh, in in, in American society, which was no, they they were atheists, uh, mm -hmm. but it wasn't something that was um, a super important uh, part yeah, of their identity. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so that was just sort of a way in which we were different from the, the other folks, more, most of them, I suppose, in, in Upper Arlington, which is Ohio, which is where I uh -huh. grew up. That's a suburb of Columbus, yep. Ohio, mm -hmm. yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, and when I was uh, 12 years old, I discovered several copies of the Humanist magazine mm. uh, in the Upper Arlington Public Library, of oh, all wow. places, uh, very progressive on their part. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and yeah, no, it was really exciting because it was my first real um, awareness that or led to my first real awareness that there was a whole community of thinkers and reasoners that were interested in being good without God and were interested in kind of using, um, you know, their rational minds to uh, explore and understand the world around them mm -hmm. uh, rather than lie, relying on, you know, tradition and dogma. Um, and that just got me started in talking to uh, everybody I knew about um, you know, what do you think? Why do you think that God is real? Like, uh, tell me more about that. Like, where so your you values were 12 from? when this started? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so shortly after that, actually, um, and I wish I could remember how I first found them. I think, um, I might have found your videos on cable access. Oh, that's as a right. Matter of yes, fact. in Columbus, I had a cable access show. Yeah, yeah. and it advertised the Dial and Atheist service, uh, uh -huh. and which I don't know if your viewers are familiar with or not. <laughs> but uh, people used to Frank used to record these telephone messages, and you could call in and hear a short two or three or five minute yeah. uh, little message uh, about, uh, you know, about thinking critically and about atheism and whatever it was that was on Frank's mind. And, um, and we all... And Rutabaga Baby, our oh, theme right, song. Oh, right, theme song, yes. <laughs> our theme definitely... song, Rutabaga Baby, was composed for the Dial and Atheist line. Remember, uh, remember hearing that when I uh, <laughs> dialed in back in uh, <laughs> the 90s at some point. Yeah, and, you know, it was... Um, a bunch of little things like that that, um, you know, kind of made this not just uh, like, okay, I happen to not believe in God, but that, you know, that there might actually be sort of a, uh, a community of people who were really interested in um, taking seriously the questions of like, uh, you know, okay, given that we are kind of here on the earth to uh, sort of figure out why our lives are important and what gives them meaning, like, and we don't think that that the answer is just like that we are handed this from on high, but that it's something that we're responsible for figuring out on our own. Like, how do we do that? So um, that has been a fascinating and exciting kind of uh, 
beacon for me for um, for all of my adult life and through well, my teen years as well. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that, and uh, I, uh, I I know that there have been a number of people who uh, listened to the Dial an Atheist uh, programs, um, and uh, one I remember he called me after he'd been listening to it for five years uh -huh. and said, "Well, you know, Frank, um, I was a devout Lutheran, but <laughs> but now." How, how do I get to your programs? How, how do I get to your luncheons? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But anyway, you, you had a real advantage, I would say, uh, in that your parents uh, were unbelievers, shall we say. Yeah, I think that's um, fair. And uh, reasonable people all the way around. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't have a great hurdle to uh, surmount, to, to, to get over. Um, and I assume you didn't have any kinds of... Um, um, emotional disturbances because of giving up uh, your imaginary friend in the sky or anything like that. So no, no, I, I yeah didn't have one to give up. Yeah, uh, I, I had a I had a regular old imaginary friend uh, <laughs> that yeah that I had to give up, but uh, that yeah. that was not too terribly dramatic. Yeah, when uh, I was a little kid. Yeah, uh -huh. um, yeah, and I, I do want to say that like so I I think when I tell this story maybe I make my parents. Um, sound uh, less critical than they were, because although they weren't like, you know, here's, uh, you know, here are all these books on atheism, like that, yeah, not yeah, at all, yeah, they, they were yeah. very interested in making sure that, um, that they knew that I was responsible for deciding my own values. Sure, sure. And, you know, they wanted to reason through me with like, you know, well, what are the consequences of actions exactly. you might be considering? Yeah, yeah. Um, but they were very big on me deciding my own path and my own identity, and... I have friends today who had to struggle for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and in fact, I hear from secular students all the time, all around our network of students all over the country, that, you know, that they were raised in, an, in a, a religiously oppressive kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's not everybody. But no, uh, no. For, for the students who do come up that way and then get to college and run into a Secular Student Alliance community, that ends up being sometimes um, just staggeringly meaningful to them. And that, so the, that blows the, me away. The, the community uh, experiences uh, and opportunities that you provide for those students is, is probably crucially important. Uh, that they that, have community. They're not alone. They're not isolated. Yeah. They're not some sort of freak in right. Alabama. Or exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and it's um, it's it's all over the country. Um, in, interestingly enough, um, you mm -hmm. know, it's certainly in higher concentrations in right. certain parts. But there's absolutely people that come from really re religious backgrounds all over all over the country. And um, you know, for the people who really didn't have uh, permission to think for themselves, and especially for people who were raised in a situation where social acceptance and sort of praise in general was um, riveted to uh, believing in mm -hmm. some sort of supernatural claims, mm -hmm. um, that community is indeed uh, absolutely vital to, to yeah. those folks kind yeah. of having the... Um, Having a situation where it is, you know, considerably less painful uh, to, to sure. break away and to sure. find their own path. Sure. Yeah, have some emotional support from, and especially it's helpful when you can have some emotional support from uh, your your peers. Uh, yes. People your own age. Now, um, okay, so we had the Dial and Atheist line and the cable access television, and then you got to college, right? Um, yeah, so uh, right before college, a uh, good friend of mine... Um, uh, Rob Nakervis is his name. Yeah. Uh, he took me to, uh, he was a year ahead of me and he went to um, school at Ohio State and uh, I was planning to go there too and he was like, hey, Og, there's an atheist meeting tonight or, you know, a couple nights yeah. uh, and there's a speaker, he's involved with American Atheists somehow, um, you know, he, and he's the guy that runs the Dial an Atheist line. He's Frank Sindler. I was like, oh, Frank, well, that's great. Uh, and, um, you know, do you want to come? And I was like, absolutely sure. So I didn't have a car at the time and, <laughs> and Rob drove me and, uh, yeah. And, and you were the speaker and, um, and yeah, I had a great time and met the other students there and, um, really, really enjoyed that. And was so, so looking forward to, uh, having that community there, uh, for when I got to school there mm -hmm. in the fall. And, uh, when I got there, you know, it was, 
obviously a lot to you know learn and, and uh, take in as I'm you know starting school but I you know checked around and like asked people and um, and the thing is that like well what I found over the course of a few months was that the leaders had all graduated over the summer all right right yeah and there was no more Prometheus that was the name of that group uh -huh. and um, and so I was kind of left with this uh, vacuum like I was really excited for the possibility and then it wasn't there and um, and that was you know that was disappointing um, but I, uh, and I kind of like idly chatted with some of my friends about like, Hey, you know, it sucks. It's not around anymore. Like, I, is there a way that we could kind of bring that back? And, um, and that seemed very, very daunting to us. Mm -hmm. Um, just because none of us had really like run a group before. Certainly none of us had started a group before. Um, so, uh, we, we talked about it on and off. Um, but I actually, um, was, dating someone who was a year younger than me, uh, and then she went away to school, and there was a group at, at her school, and I went and met some of those people, and also um, got connected to some of the folks at the uh, Council for Secular Humanism, uh, and they actually were having a, a conference in Cincinnati, uh, and uh, went down and with uh, another uh, friend from uh, Ohio State, and got to meet a bunch of other atheists, uh, which I think was the first time like um, that I'd been in a group larger than just, I think maybe there were, I don't know, 20 or 30 mm -hmm, people when, mm -hmm, yeah. when you were speaking about it, you know, a considerably yeah, larger yeah. group, and, um, and lots and lots of students from all over the country and got to, got to know them. I sense that we are now getting close to the point where we are going to be founding Secular Student Alliance, and so I think this is a good place to uh, end this first interview, okay. and uh, we'll have another interview coming up on um, the uh, origins of the Secular Student Alliance and its early history and the trials and tribulations of getting the group uh, to fly, so to speak. And then I think we're going to have a third program on all the wonderful things and services that Secular Student Alliance is providing right now and what they're going to do in the near future. So tune in next time and we'll hear about the origins and history of the Secular Student Alliance and the role that August Brunsman played therein. For now, and for American Atheists, I'm Frank Zindler.